So uh, let's get started off looking at kind of the big picture, right? The 30,000 foot view. What's going on in uh, Asian economies? If you look at the size of the world's top five biggest economies, uh, you see that the U.S. is still the single national largest economy in the whole world. China is number two. India is now number three. And Japan has moved to number four. That was a change that happened really between uh, 2010 and 2011. Partly you're seeing a, a huge issue. I'm sorry, 2011 and 2012. Um, you're seeing a huge issue with the um, disaster in Tohoku that led to uh, minus growth in Japan that year. Um, you're seeing a general slowdown across the top economies, but kind of keep an eye out on the world growth rate at 3.3% and kind of watch what's happening to other countries as we go along. So these are the top five countries. Notice. Uh, both China and India had 10% growth back in 2010. This has dropped back noticeably. The growth, the growth rate decline in China arguably has had a much bigger impact than that in India. And we'll see that especially when you see what I would call the jumping off points to China. These are the other Asian countries that make it into the top 50 countries of the world in terms of the size of their economies. And some really shocking stuff here. First of all, look at Singapore. From 14.8% growth in 2010 to 2.1% growth in 2012. Wow. Taiwan, from 10.7% uh, growth to 1.3% growth. Hong Kong, from 7.1% growth to 1.8% growth. Notice these countries are now below the world average, even though they were considerably above the world average in 2010. One factor may be the slowdown in the, in the uh, China economy. A lot of these, com uh, eco these other economies were really kind of jumping off points to China, and arguably, the two or three percent slowdown that's happened across China has had a much bigger impact on these other countries. Now there are other things going on too. One of them is probably the uncertainty in financial markets. That was always been a big part of Hong Kong and Singapore. But it hit Taiwan just about as bad and the financial sector is not that big an element of the Taiwan economy. So um, that's one thing that's going on. Another thing that's going on is that you, you see kind of a slowdown in Korea, too, uh, from 6.3% to 2.7%. That may have to do with slowdown in the, um, the economy in, in China, but it could just be, um, you know, kind of other sort of supply chain issues that are going on. Korea may be getting less... Uh, outsourced manufacturing than it used to because of the increase in its wage levels. Uh, notice that Korea now has a GDP per person, which is roughly equivalent to income, of $32,000, which starts to put it into the expensive country category. The Southeast Asian countries are interesting because they haven't slowed down so much. Indonesia, from 6.2% to 6%. There's a great example. Now, in the middle of this, you get some strange stuff. Uh, Thailand went from 7.8% through a period of 0.1% to 5.6%. Anybody take a guess why? Flooding. Flooding. You got it. Direct hit, just like the big disaster in Japan in 2011. Um, Malaysia, 7.2% to 4.4%. Philippines, 7.6% to 4.8%. Um, Vietnam, 6.8% to 5.1%. The Southeast Asian countries are still higher growth rate than the uh, world average. Now, there are various tendencies. Growth rates tend to decline as the individual income levels go up. 
the size of the economy is bigger and so it's harder to get an extra 3% on an economy when it's a giant economy than it is when it's a, a smaller economy. But still, this is a very interesting kind of uh, pattern that you see here. Um, yeah, okay, we talked about that. It's really these jumping off points to China that are now well below the average growth rates for the world. And India also had a noticeable slowdown, but that really hasn't been as obviously connected to uh, the situation in other economies. We do see a big shift in the Chinese economy. I think that China has been a gold rush. And that means that getting to the gold field faster than anybody else was extremely important. Um, now, government policy is much more focused on constraining domestic growth and managing the kind of economic bubble so that it doesn't all burst at once. There is a noticeable shift in the trade balance in China. It used to be that China was running over a 10% account surplus. That's down to 2 or 3%, which means that more Chinese output is staying in the Chinese domestic economy. That is a huge shift. Uh, there are some other things that, you know, they may be noise, but you've got to think about them. Political change in China, Japan, and Korea. Especially in China, it typically takes months for a new government to sort of take form. And that just sort of made everything wait for a while uh, from last October. Japan and South Korea also have brand new governments. I was in Korea at the beginning of, I'm sorry, not the beginning of this month, but last week. And um, everybody was waiting to see who would be the new ministers. The territorial disputes over the islands in the middle of the Pacific have reduced trade between Japan and other Asian countries. That has impacted trade between Japan and China and also Japan and Korea. And, you know, all the uncertainties about the EU, starting with Greece and going through Portugal and uh, now lately with Cyprus, uh, has had an impact on things. The U.S. elections probably had an impact on things, although definitely see an uptick in the feeling of the American economy at the beginning of 2013. But what is probably a more important change is a structural transformation that is really in the early stages of hitting China and other uh, recently developed Asia economies. And that is a shift toward more emphasis on knowledge intensive industries. You can also look at this, you can also call it a shift to being an innovation-driven economy. The uh, OECD has a technical term that they call knowledge and technology intensive industries. And if you notice how much of the American economy comes from knowledge intensive industries, and it's a lot more in 2010 than it was in 1995. Uh, you see a similar jump up by more than 5% of the economy increased to be part of the, from these knowledge, intensive and knowledge and technology intensive industries in the EU. Japan is also kind of up in this. But then you get the BRICS. And with the BRICS, it's still only about 20% of the economy is accounted for by knowledge intensive industries. Um, but if you look at the share of GDP that is contributed by high-tech manufacturing in the United States, it's floated around for the last, you know, for 15 years or so, it's floated around this 30% figure. With Japan, it's actually declined. In China, this number is going up pretty drastically. So these are the percentages over here. That's the actual dollar contributions over here. The Asia 8 countries I've got on the slide, the, this is National Science Foundation. They uh, send out these uh, indicators every year. Similarly, OK, got to walk over here anyway. Similarly, if you look at the new US patent registrations, whose first inventor has a foreign address, you see that Japan is by far the country that supplies the most U.S. patents outside the U.S. It's been the case for a long time. The Asia 8 is definitely increasing. 
Notice how China has started from almost nothing, but it's now on the showing, showing up on the chart. If you look now at that as a percentage, you see that Japan's percentage is declining, the EU's percentage is declining, and Asia 8 is going up noticeably, especially Korea, especially other manufacturing-related economies, and also China is on the way up. So what you're seeing is you're seeing a greater integration. You wouldn't file for a U.S. patent unless you want to do business in the U.S. The patent only protects you in the country where you file. So if you file a U.S. patent, it's probably because you've already filed in your home country. That means that uh, you think this is valuable enough to pay the filing fee and the maintenance fee in the United States as well. These tend to be regarded as high-value patents. And so um, you know, what you're seeing, you're seeing an increasingly international R&D community. Number of papers published in S&T journals. Japan is flat for 15 years, but look at China. Definitely long-term investment in science and technology. This would be even before you've got a patent in the offing, right? This is earlier stage research, more basic stage research. Asia 8 is moving up. Asia 10 is the Asia 8 plus Japan and China. So here's the Asia 8, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. Um, what's happening? One of the things that's happening is a major change in Asia that's related to economic development. There's a group called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor that I'll talk about more in just a minute. And they separate economies into three stages. They don't call them developing economies and whatever anymore. They call them factor-driven economies, which to most people would be industrializing economies, efficiency-driven economies, and then uh, innovation-driven economies. And if you look at the kind of things that happen, you see the change in the types of opportunities that you find in different countries. China's been a gold rush, a huge gold rush. You've had massive urbanization with millions of people moving into the cities who didn't live there. A lot of China is industrializing in ways that it wasn't industrial a few years ago. To be competitive in China, getting there first seems to be a major factor. You don't have people spending a lot of time developing elegant technologies for a market like that. You get there first and you make money, and then you can develop technology as you go along. The focus of government laws in this kind of a situation is on establishing an industry base. This is one stage when you start to get protectionist legislation. And you also have a lot of kind of basic laws, basic laws about how you, you know, commercial codes and so forth. At the second stage of this kind of development, macroeconomic development, typically what happens is you've got so many people and so many new factories that there are label shortages and capital shortages. The government becomes very concerned with making sure that it allocates labor and capital efficiently so that people are not wasting their time in things that are not going to lead to anything. Um, in this kind of stage is where you get very strong manufacturing skills. This is where countries like Japan in the 1960s and Korea in the 1980s were clearly uh, opening up new markets, either domestic or international, and they were focusing on efficiency, rapid scaling, especially in manufacturing, also high quality of goods. At the last stage, innovation-driven economies are a different kind of thing. First of all, you really only need a high school education to work in a factory, most people. But that generation of people has children that they educate. And as education spreads throughout the population, kids don't want to do the same work that their parents did. They have a desire for greater opportunities that they're looking for. In this kind of a situation, the opportunities really come from out-of-the-box thinking. This is where you get people who come up with ideas that nobody knew they needed until they saw them, right? 
the definition of innovation uh, as applied to Steve Jobs. He knew what people needed before they could figure it out. Um, in this kind of a situation, managing risk, allowing risk in the right way, running an efficient commercialization, an efficient innovation system is absolutely critical. And being able to sustain growth for major companies becomes more and more difficult. This is where you get the government support for entrepreneurship. This is where you get government support for things like Small Business Innovative Research Grants, SBIR grants, that came into the U.S. from the late 1990s, mid-1990s, I should say. And what they do is they allow startup ideas to have a little bit more money so that they can get to market. It subsidizes the commercialization. So these kind of changes are going on in uh, Asia right now. If you look at the United States, we really don't have one single system. Silicon Valley is the innovation-based economy to end <laughs> all innovation-based economies. However, um, most of the other regions in the U.S. are considerably behind here. If you go to some place like Detroit, if you go to some place like the American Southeast, you will find places where the attitudes are very different. Uh, they're very different toward entrepreneurship. They're very different toward risk. Now, to have an innovation center like Silicon Valley, you must have a symbiotic relationship with a good market. The growth of Silicon Valley until about 1995 was probably mostly due to the U.S. market. Since 95, I would say we are really more global than we are sensitive to the U.S. We are very heavily focused on Asia here in Silicon Valley. If you go to the U.S. East Coast, you don't really get the kind of focus on China and India and Korea and Malaysia and wherever that you do here. Japan and Korea were so successful at this efficiency stage that it's been very difficult for them to get out of these risk averse, pick the winner, get a good job with a prestigious company kind of attitude and very difficult to open up with the kind of freewheeling approach to innovation that you really need at stage three. Um, stage three looks very uncertain. It looks very risky. It's not a future that you want your children to have. Um, China is trying to avoid stage two and have some sort of a hybrid between this major manufacturing base and an innovation-based economy all at once. It's going directly from the gold rush into a model that's trying to exploit its innovation capabilities but maintain a very strong manufacturing base, partly through a lot of attention to domestic market development. But um, I think that it will be really interesting to see how China's very compressed economic development will play into this. In um, India, what you've got is moving from a stage one kind of, you know, industrializing economy to a place that have islands of incredibly advanced innovation-based activities right alongside bottom of the pyramid kind of business opportunities. And this makes the kind of attention to the bottom of the pyramid that you see among the innovation community in India extremely interesting because they may come up with ideas of how to solve problems of very poor communities that we would never come up with in a more advanced economy. So this is what's going on. How does this impact entrepreneurship? First of all, any questions or comments about that section before we move on? Go ahead, Ayla. Um, I, I uh, heard a statistic the other day that I uh, was wondering if you could confirm or uh, whether this is uh, uh, just speculation, but um, I heard that the Asian middle class was growing from about 500 million right now to 1.75 billion in seven years. This was a Singaporean visitor at a you know, TV program that I saw. And, and how that plays into both the macroeconomic development and entrepreneurial opportunities as a result of that. That's about right. I mean, uh, I've got a slide in Japanese 
that I gave in a presentation a few months ago that pretty much confirms that by country. Now, what you see is you see India in continuing a very rapid growth of the middle class, right? And in China, you see a trail off in the projection around 2025 because of the aging population. And that's going to be an impact on a number of countries in Asia that is maybe a slowing, will slow down this increase of the middle class because people go to fixed income after they retire. Uh, but yes, a lot of this has to do with the appearance of a new set of consumers. Consumer uh, activities Let's see, consumer, the, the part of GDP, consumer activities are in China have been growing between 12 and 16% a year. And the GDP growth was never more than about 10.5. So a lot of it is fueled more and more by consumption and less by investment. But China's really interesting. The slowdown that's been happening over the last year is having some major impact. And one of the first places we see major impact is in entrepreneurship. I've um, got some data I want to present from a group called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And just so you know who these people are, uh, it was really Babson College in partnership with the London Business School. Every year they do a survey of over 100,000 people. So the 2012 survey was almost 200,000 people that they interviewed in 69 different economies, meaning countries, right? And they do two surveys, an adult population survey, and they also do a national expert survey. So what I've got for you today all comes from this adult population survey. And the key kind of rate that I want to look at is what is often called the T rate. And this is total early stage entrepreneurial activity. People in, who are grown ups but not too old who are either a nascent entrepreneur or the owner manager of a new business. And they've got specific definitions of this. Either if you're a nascent entrepreneur, you're setting up a business, but you haven't paid a salary. If you're the owner manager of a new business, you've paid wages and salary to the owners for at least three months, but no more than 42 months. Beyond that, you get established business, even if it's a small business, okay? So they have an, a special term for this T-rate. So if you look at the T rate in the United States, it has gone to about 13%. This is not too drastic a change. After a downturn, you typically see a reduction in the T rate in an advanced economy because people are afraid of, they can't get money. The investors don't give money, right? And and so uh, typically in the, in the percentage of people who are actively involved in either starting or growing a brand new company. But the first really drastic kind of thing you see on this graph is China. When I pointed this out last year, 24% of the population in China was actively engaged in starting or running a new company. And that dropped in one year to 13%, which is an incredible kind of outcome of some sort of a psychological process, a combination of psychological process and also the availability of capital. As we'll see a little bit later, uh, venture capital investments were down by 40% in China in between 2012 and 2011. Um, right now, Thailand has the highest T rate that you'll find. And, um, you know, then you get kind of in the middle. The tigers tend to be in the middle, uh, except for um, Taiwan, which has moved up to 12% uh, people involved in T rate again. Really, you've got Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong all kind of down around this 7 or 8% area. And, um, then down at the bottom, you've got Japan, the lowest T rate of the set, right? Um, 
You may be interested to know that in these 69 economies that they look at, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest T-rate, up around 69 or 70 percent. Anybody care to guess why? You done? of subsistence uh, businesses to just having to create their own job because the infrastructure of large companies doesn't exist. That's it. you got to create your own job. You have no choice. Uh, so the T-rate is <coughs> higher in a country that has a lower degree of economic development. Anyway, this is what's been going on for the last 10 years or so in the U.S. and select Asia economies. Um, this whole point that I was starting to, we were starting to talk about, the T rate tends to be higher when GDP per person, income per person, is lower. You see this range between zero and maybe 10 or $15,000 is, you see a lot of countries who are, have relatively high T rates here. Then you see between about 18,000 and about $40,000 this kind of middle range, these are the efficiency economies that they were talking about in, in uh, GEM. And then as you go further, you see uh, really entrepreneurship of opportunity. This is where there aren't any salaried jobs, so you've got to make your own. And this is where you become an entrepreneur because you believe that it's the best outcome, the best thing you can do for your career. You get the best return. Um, if you look at the U.S. attitudes, they go on in this survey, and here's the T-rate, 13%. Of the people who are not actively engaged in entrepreneurship, 43% of the respondents saw good opportunities for entrepreneurs. Of the people not engaged in entrepreneurial activities, 53%, or I'm sorry, 56% of them thought that they had the capabilities to be an entrepreneur. We're very self-confident in the U.S. Then of the people who were not engaged in entrepreneurship, 32% of them said that fear of failure was a major factor in not starting a business. And one other thing that they ask everybody is, do you see yourself starting a business in the foreseeable future? So of course, these are people who are not already doing entrepreneurship. Same number, 13%. If the entrepreneurial intentions is greater or the same amount as this, then you kind of see an uptick on the whole kind of attitude toward entrepreneurship. There are people are just waiting for a better opportunity. So if you see how the U.S. compares to some of the other places, in uh, China and Thailand, Thailand had the highest T rate, right? And China now has a T-rate that's the same as the U.S. Not a whole lot of difference in the perceived opportunities between the U.S. and Thailand. Fewer opportunities were perceived in China. Last year when I did this, more people saw opportunities in China. The uh, perceived capabilities, the U.S. is extremely self-confident. Um, I'm not really sure, this, this figure, I'm suspicious of any kind of a self-reporting survey like this because people tend to be humble in Asia. And so I'm not really sure if they're just underplaying it or whatever, but certainly the percentage of people seeing opportunities needs to be about the same or even a little bit greater than the number of people who see themselves as able to take, take advantage of it. Fear of failure was a major demotivator in Thailand. 50% of the people were worried about, you know, what would happen if they failed. The U.S. and China are pretty much similar in regard to fear of failure. Um, on the entrepreneurial intentions, notice that both Thailand and China had higher intentions than their actual T rate. So probably there are people waiting for the economy to pick up a little bit and for the opportunity to get a little better. It's not that they feel like there's something systemic that's going to prevent them from being an entrepreneur. Now, if you look at Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea, the T rates are lower, except in Singapore, than in uh, the U.S. 
the perceived opportunities is wide range, but nothing as much as you see on the U.S. respondents. Especially South Korea is very negative about the um, opportunities for entrepreneurs. You've got an economy where large businesses control a major, you know, major segments of the population. It's really hard to get to market without having uh, some sort of a connection to one of the big business groups. Everybody is very much kind of right in the middle of a quarter of the population seeing themselves as having the ability to be entrepreneurs. This is kind of a negative factor, far negative compared to the U.S. The fear of failure is pretty high, all of them, more than it is for the U.S. And the intention to start a business at some point is relatively high for all of these. So again, you see people who are biding their time and waiting for the right opportunity. Then you get to uh, Malaysia and Japan with, uh, yeah, this is just really sad about Japan. 6% of the people not engaged in entrepreneurship thought that there were activities to be an entrepreneur, that there were opportunities to be successful as an entrepreneur. 9% of them thought they had the abilities to be an entrepreneur. 53% of them were worried about they failed. And 2% of the people not engaged and actively engaged in entrepreneurship were willing to think about starting a company in the foreseeable future. I have to say that this tracks the talks that I give in Japan, where I'll go to a talk, you know, a room of 100 students or 200 students, I ask, how many people would like to start a company? I'll get one or two hands raised. So that's kind of a deep blue funk. <laughs> They're red colored on the, on the chart, but uh, very definitely a um, negative attitude toward this. So uh, let's look at the environment a little bit more, and then we'll uh, go on and have some Q&A. Questions about this last thing, the attitudes. Go ahead. Well, the business schools, how did they, um, you know, it, it, is there much going on in the business schools trying to change that attitude uh, among people? And Yes, entrepreneur education is a very popular thing. <laughs> Just to, but However, then not to um, do anything with it. In any economic equation, you've got supply side and demand side. And the schools are really supply side. And unless something can be done to make it better access to the market and really being successful, plus a lot of Asian uh, entrepreneurs will start a company without having a sense of the growth expectations that we have when we start companies here. They don't expect to make the next Google. And you can go too far that way. I mean, sometimes I think the mood around Stanford is a little too much that everybody has to start the next Google. But um, if you have a niche family business as the ultimate outcome of an entrepreneurial activity, that's not enough of an upside to really get good people involved in the, in the program. The founder will be there, but who do you get to come work for the company? So I'm, I'm concerned that the business schools are, are half of the equation, the other half has yet to be solved. You had a question. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this environment a little bit more. Um, Yes, entrepreneurial behavior is affected, first of all, by the presence or absence of career alternatives. What are your choices? Go ahead. Get into that. What, how would you compare the VC uh, structure compared to what you see here in Venture Silicon? capital? Yeah, exactly. Got a couple of slides coming up. Great. Okay, cool. And yeah, we'll talk more about that. Other questions? Okay. So. Um, yeah, the economic structure and dynamics, the availability of capital and the conditions for accessing it, the labor market issues, especially the fluidity of the labor market. And it's not only the people who will be entrepreneurs who are important. Probably the single most important group of people in Silicon Valley that nobody talks about are the people who go to work for growth phase companies. Companies that have 50 employees and they're on the way to having 5,000. 
they're not founders, they're not really entrepreneurs, but they're willing to risk their careers on a high growth company for a few stock options and, you know, the chance to buy a house in Palo Alto sometime. So um, the availability of human resources is a major issue behind the labor markets. You do have infrastructure issues and then you've got these kind of cultural expectations. One of my favorites that I've mentioned in quite a few of my speeches is um, a professor at a Japanese university asked his students if they were interested in becoming entrepreneurs. Nobody said yes. He sent out the questionnaire to like 300 students and he did an analysis of the answers that came back and the single most common <laughs> answer was my mom would be against the idea. So <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I heard the same thing from somebody from India though that in India you can't get married if you become an entrepreneur first. So yeah, go ahead, Ethan. You actually last year, but uh, so venture capitalists in the U.S. going back to uh, the first, build up to the first bubble, had to actually spend time on the phone with the mothers of, of brides that were considering uh, uh, young Indian men who were working in high tech companies here convince them that those companies were a viable alternative. You've got to get the whole family to buy into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, let's, let's take a look at this a little bit more. If you look at how an innovation system works, it really is composed of people and capital and ideas. One definition of innovation is that an innovation is a new combination of people, an idea, and capital. Um, and of course it rests on an infrastructure. The entrepreneurial culture is really a dynamic behind the system. The uh, framework, you need really all these kinds of people to have a successful entrepreneurial sector in the economy. The knowledge workers are probably the single most important group that is not mentioned a whole lot. Um, capital. For a real innovation-based system, you need a real good R&D funding coming in from somewhere. Even at the stages before commercialization, basic science and technology, the role of the government in an innovation system cannot be underestimated. Then you run into the high-risk investment capital that is what most people talk about in an entrepreneurial system. There's one other very important source of capital for startup companies, and that's revenue. How can you get customers? And can you really get enough revenue to gradually move your growth away from the uh, investors and into you know, a revenue positive model? The ideas are going to come from multiple disciplines, not any single discipline. And then look at the kind of creativity. Too many places that look at entrepreneurship are looking at good R&D people and good technical creativity, but figuring out how to make money with something is as important or as difficult a challenge for creativity as it is to come up with the invention anyway. And then as an entrepreneur, you have to be very clever how to obtain resources. How do you do your marketing without spending any money? You know, of course you have none, no money for advertising. Of course you can't pay people. What do you do? So. Um, you know, this kind of, this really, the elements are not to be, it's not a simple kind of thing. Um, but it's really the dynamics that kind of push people together and have them really, everybody being interested in what's next, what's the next new thing, and how can I play, is uh, really the focus of a lot of the human networking in Silicon Valley. It's not just that people come together and talk to each other, it's what they talk about. Um, so not everybody's going to start their company, but you do need to have good social standing. And it also really helps here that, you know, I bet if I asked for people to raise their hands, how many people know someone who's starting a company or has started a company? Just about everybody would raise your hands here. Not in a lot of places, but... Um, Along with that kind of experience comes sort of a sense of whether this idea is going to work or whether this is <laughs> a dog. Um, 
And also the willingness to really think big and be ready to change the world is part of this whole entrepreneurial attitude. Um, for it really to turn into a system like the Valley, you have to have this iteration. You have to see this happening over and over again so that the path to entrepreneurship, the path to working in a startup company becomes relatively straightforward becomes transparent to people so that they see how to do it. Um, as part of that, exits are critical. Right now, exits in Asia are not nearly as big as they are here. Most exits in the US come from acquisitions by big companies. Most exits in Asia come from IPOs, unless the company dies. And the IPOs tend to be small. They tend to create a lot of niche companies where the biggest problem is the founder of the company finding somebody to take over when he or she's ready to retire. Um, so anyway, these are kind of, you know, you need this kind of system going on. Let's look at capital. There are a lot of different kinds of capital that are involved in the growth of a company, not just the startup phase. It's really hard to get data about the first stages of this process. Angel investors don't have to make public their investments. There are groups of angels that do make public and do show you their portfolios, but um, it's the VC community where you've got a number of different kind of surveys of what's going on in venture capital. US baseline is that we've had a reduction between uh, the number of deals and also the amount invested between 2011 and 2012. It's not a huge decline, but it's a noticeable decline. And of this, the biggest kind of decline happened at the, um, the seed stage. Harder to get early stage money in venture capital now. Uh, I bet if you ask an entrepreneur, they would say, yeah. <laughs> Tell me something else I don't know. Um, the uh, sectors that people are investing in here, and all these slides will be posted. Uh, the, the sectors that people are investing in, software is huge. We have the information technology third revolution uh, which is cloud computing that is pushing a lot of mobile applications, pushing a lot of, you know, uh, new kinds of businesses that were not possible before. Location-based services would not be possible without cloud computing. So sure enough, software is still in the top. There were more deals and more money went into software in 2012, even though the total amount of VC in 2012 was less. So uh, if you look at where the biggest decline is, industry and energy. Nobody likes uh, solar cell companies anymore, right? Uh, this is a noticeable drop that probably has to do with a few high profile failures. Um, medical devices are down quite a bit. That's an interesting decline. I'm surprised to see that. I'm also surprised to see IT services down as much as it is. Um, what you're seeing is a gradual increase in deal size, too, in a lot of these sectors. The average size of a venture capital deal is probably a little bit bigger uh, in 2012 than it was in 2011. So that's the US baseline. Head to head, let's look at China. Um, China, remember, went from a 24% T rate to a 13% T rate between 2011 and 2012. Well, the amount of venture capital invested in 2011 was $6 billion US. The amount invested in 2012 was 3.7 billion. That's a 40% decline. The number of deals declined by 44%. So um, this is, a huge change. In uh, the customer services sector actually was relatively stable. I didn't put the 2011 data in, but it didn't drop that much. Information technologies and the other sectors were dropping quite a bit more from uh, 2011 on. One thing to note about 
uh, venture capital deals in China, the average deal size in China is over $11 million. That's considerably higher, bigger than the average deal size in the U.S. And what it means is that you've got a lot of big projects that are being invested, probably more like private equity investments here in the U.S., not as much investing in a technology to incubate as you are investing in a factory to get things out to people. So that's what's going on in, in China. Um, in India, even though the total economy declined quite a bit in India, you see a decline, a little bit of a decline in venture capital, but not a whole lot. What you're seeing is a lot of noise in the quarters. In um, 2007, 2008 was the huge peak in India venture capital investment. And then 2009, sure enough, after the 2008 downturn, it tanked there. Investors stopped uh, letting their money go there as well. Um, so that's the way that looks. In, uh, by industry, information technology and information technology services are by far the biggest sector for investment in India. Healthcare and life sciences is good. Agribusiness is noticeable, that it's not noticeable in either China or the US. You do have some interesting investments in manufacturing. Now, one fascinating point is that Brazil has really hit the radar of investors for technology companies. And that may be taking a lot of money away from the other BRICS. Um, so this is kind of what the landscape looks like for VC by industry in India. Now, it's always hard for a, a startup company to get its first customer. In the US, open innovation, where the big companies are always on the lookout for things that they can scoop up from the little companies, the startups, is a major driving factor behind first customer acquisition and also exit in the US system. Um, so, you know, my sense is that people have focused a lot on the supply side. They focused a lot on the entrepreneur production, startup company creation, and haven't focused nearly as much on startup company growth in Asia. Uh, and that pretty much applies all the way across the Asian economies. To a certain extent, we see a much more mature system here in uh, the Silicon Valley. If you look at the labor market, uh, <laughs> I found an absolutely fascinating uh, report by the Department of Labor in the middle of last year. It was a 30-year longitudinal study, and they found that between the ages of 18 to 46, people in the U.S. had an average of 11.3 jobs. Wow. Wow. Uh, if you have university, a university degree, you have an even higher job turnover rate. So this is where you get the sense that, you know, you stay in a job for three years or so, and if you can't find a better job, there's something wrong with you. Uh, it's an incredibly mobile labor market. Even among 40 to 46-year-olds, 33% of their jobs ended in less than a year, and 69% ended in less than five years. What happens in a situation of this kind of uncertainty? You better learn how to be an entrepreneur. Even if you're going to go to work for somebody else's company, you have to be in charge of your own career. No one is going to set the rails for you. And so this is, uh, you know, definitely promoting entrepreneurship in the U.S., uh, as well as all sorts of feelings of uncertainty. Um, in Asia, the labor markets are quite fluid in China and India, although what you get is you get competition among prestige companies. It's very hard to get and keep people in a company because they'll be scouted out, scooped up by somebody else. But the people doing the scooping tend to be bigger companies. The labor markets are not fluid at all in Japan and Korea. There's this tradition of kind of lifetime employment that is not really 
codified in any kind of a contract, but has definitely, it goes back to this old efficiency-based, efficiency-driven economy where there was a shortage of labor, and so you had to give great conditions to the people to get them to come work in your company. Um, I think that this is changing. The economic slowdown in China is going to make it harder for a lot of university students to get a job. It's also going to reduce the number of jobs that people can get on the outside anyway. The aging population, however, works against that. As the population continues to age, it may be, there may be less pressure. In Japan last year, the total number of jobs in the labor force declined, and yet unemployment declined even more because the population is starting to shrink. So um, this is going to kind of <laughs> have an opposite impact, may actually make, make it less attractive to do the risky path of being an entrepreneur. There is inter increased international mobility. We're trying to do better about bringing in gifted young people into the US. And in general, international mobility is up. And a lot of the new industries that we have startups in now are intrinsically global. One of the themes that we're going to look at this quarter is the, this emerging wave of global startups. That where startups are really, and the entrepreneurs are trying to go global earlier rather than later in their development. Uh, infrastructure, yeah, every year Dun & Bradstreet does a ranking of where it's easiest to do business, and Singapore usually comes out number one. And Hong Kong is real close to it in terms of the quality of labor contracts and also the ability of the legal system to enforce contracts and that kind of thing. Um, China is low on this. It's hard to do business in China. You have a lot of complexity. You have a lot of opaque relationships with government. You have a lot of things where guanxi, who you know and how you know them, becomes as important as what you have in your company. But one noticeable trend is I'm seeing more Y Combinator type incubators. And I just use them or 500 startups kind of as an example. Because these are incubators that are focusing more on very short term programs, three to six months programs, not on giving a company cheap rent until they have a better you know, financial situation. That's not the point of these new incubators. They really are educational programs. Um, so there are three examples that I'm personally aware of. Um, this is kind of the summary for the talk, and then we've got a few minutes for Q&A. There have been a lot of systemic challenges in Asia that uh, have worked to inhibit entrepreneurial activity. The lack of fluidity in the labor market, um, but that's fading away. The whole idea of bigger companies having higher prestige, that being the place where your mom wants you to go to work, um, you know, there's a reason why that this happened, but there's a lot of dissatisfaction. There's a lot of lack of trust against big companies by young people. I think a real generational change is in progress. Especially in East Asia, you have several things that go back to Confucian ideals. Really, the whole idea of education in Asia is a Confucian apprenticeship system. The professor is the master and sits on the throne, and the students try to figure out what the professor is talking about. Uh, I wish I could get a job like that. Anyway, um, it doesn't promote radical creativity, but again, I'm seeing new kinds of approaches. I'm seeing new faculty who are very much Western in their approach to having Socratic dialogues with their students who are they're learning from their students as well as teaching them. The leadership comes with age is a big thing. How can you be taken seriously as an entrepreneur if you're 23 years old in a system where you've got to have gray hair before people take you seriously? How can you have mentoring in a system where 
The person with gray hair, if they tell you something, can you really tell them, I, th I don't think so, not this time? You know, I think that the mentoring works here in the Valley partly because the young people take all the advice, they think it over, and then they make the decision of what has to be done. Financing still favors low risk over high reward in uh, Asia. At the stages of the rapid growth like in China and India, people want a sure thing. They want relatively rapid revenue. They don't want to delay this by a few years. They really want to move right now. Um, you are seeing a growth of venture capital. I think the break in the pipeline is at the angel stage and just about everywhere because angel investors here tend to act very professionally and exercise due diligence and they come together in groups. They really study what uh, the investment is all about and a little too much fly by the night and sometimes. The lack of exits is a big issue in Asia and I do think that you see M&A on the rise. And so the rise of open innovation will be a big wave that's just now beginning to uh, appear in the various Asia economies. So that's my prepared remarks. We've got a few minutes for discussion. I want to tell you that next week I've got exactly the right person to come in and talk about this mystery of Southeast Asia, why they're still growing so well. Dr. Ed Rubesh is coming back from Thammasat University in Thailand. And we'll talk about the role of Asia in the glo uh, Southeast Asia in the global supply chain. Two weeks from today, I'm really excited because um, the head of the Stanford Alumni Association's industry chapter is an angel investor in India. And she's bringing one of the top rank, you know, one of the top 10 innovative companies from India with her. The CEO of Inaz is coming in along with uh, Paula Marawala. And we'll also, if Skype works, have the CEO of Redbus, which is a, a really interesting online bus ticket service in India, uh, participating in the panel discussion live. Then after that, we've got a presentation from Korea. We'll have some presentations from China and Japan. I think it'll be a great quarter. But I'd like to uh, open up the floor to questions now or comments. What do you think? Yeah, relating to your last point about the exit, it surprised me a little that there's such difficulty with exits. Given the nature of large companies in Japan and Korea, you would think the Samsungs would be looking for new and innovative companies and scoop them up like Cisco does and so on. One of the problems with a big company, and this is the famous model of open innovation by Professor Cheeseborough over at Berkeley, is that the big companies in the old days, like Xerox and AT&T and IBM, did everything in-house. They had company internal R&D that nobody could match. This leads them to become a little too happy with themselves. And so everything comes from company internal R&D. They don't buy ideas from the outside. This started to change in the US about 15 years ago. And one really important point that not many people talk about is that a company must have someone strategically considering technology alternatives outside of their own R&D group in order to effectively work with open innovation. You buy something from the outside precisely because you're not doing it inside the company. And the pride that goes along with prestige and being a big company makes that a real barrier in a lot of places. Uh, plus, if you have this situation where nobody really wants to take responsibility, um, which is a kind of universal characteristic of big companies, there are a million ways to exercise passive resistance against integrating something from outside, even if you do acquire it. So this is a hard one that the Valley is remarkably successful in adopting. Cisco was probably the first poster child for this, but now Google is. Google is doing a great open innovation based thing where internally it's spending six billion dollars on R&D, but it's buying dozens of companies every year. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting point about say the university education for entrepreneurship being supply side. So I'm going to turn it back on you and ask you, what could be done in Japan 
and Korea and other markets where there's so much fear of risk, there's so much doubt about starting a company or lack of desire to. So what could be done in those markets to change things? What would be most effective in your eyes? I think two things. First of all, there is money in Japan, if we're talking about Japan especially. I think some investor education programs would be great. You know, how to achieve a 25% annual return, right? Uh, the uh, other thing that I think would be good would be um, some sort of a subsidy program for buying things from startup companies. That could even be something local governments could do. Okay, if you're going to buy your phone system, buy it from a local startup, right? Um, where you assist companies in getting their first customers. But I do think that just in general, the education program has to focus more on growth and not just on creation. Relatively strong linkages between Australia and the, the, the other Asian countries in terms yeah. of education, capital, et cetera. Where do, you, where do they fit in this, the value chain of high tech? On a macroeconomic side, I'm afraid that Australia is still primarily kind of doing what Brazil is doing on the other side of the southern hemisphere, supplying natural resources. And there are good, you know, there's great things happening down in Australia, and it could be that what they need is a little bit more world press. Uh, about the opportunities there and so forth. But they don't really have, you know, I think ultimately what you're going to get is not so much a national-based system where Korea does this or Japan does this. You're really going to have an innovation center-based system that may look like the ancient world of city-states. You've got the Shanghai system. You've got the Seoul system. You've got the Kyoto system. You've got, you know, wherever that these innovation centers are going to be real centers of growth supporting the markets around them, but the real interesting places to live are going to be the city-states. On slide 18, um, you talked about the three different stages of economic development, and you mentioned that the Chinese goal right now is to go from stage one to stage three. Um, can you talk about the likelihood of, of them being successful in doing this? And uh, this is just a, an, a personal input. Uh, when I have friends that return from China, one of their universal comments is a lack of interest in basic R&D, in really fundamental understandings of how things work. So how can you go from stage one to three if you don't really invest in the R&D? Well, first of all, the government is investing in basic science and technology on a 50-year plan. Forget a five-year plan. Their investments are in basic science as well as in applied. And I really have to give the government of China great credit for that. They're really trying to build the country up, bootstrap it up, to have a science and technology base equal to, you know, as much, as advanced as anybody. Um, up until now, the flow of money has been very rational. Why take risk if you don't have to in order to get a good return? And I think that has stopped a lot of closer in R&D in China from commercializing like it does here, where you really have to come up with a kind of striking new technology to get on anybody's roadmap here. Uh, in China, there's been so much opportunity just to build out the current infrastructure um, that you really don't need to take technology risk you don't have to have. Over the long run, they're in a very good position. In the short run, they're in a very difficult transitional time. It remains to be seen what China's really going to feel like on the ground at 7% growth than it was at 10% growth. And historical precedent is hard to uh, really calculate on this. We really don't have any precedents like China, where in a generation since 1990, you realize that the economy of China is 31 times as big as it was in 1990. And, you know, that just doesn't happen for something that scale. So, um, there are all kinds of things that can happen in China. A government that has as much power as they do in China 
Governments could sure screw up business. I mean, I, I have to say that's a systemic danger. <laughs> On the other hand, the government there is run by technocrats. And so they tend to do a better job of things than a lot of governments do. Um, it's a good question. I would say that over the long run, China looks great. Over the medium term, it's a difficult place to do business. And we'll bring some people in who are actually helping angel, angel stage investors and also venture capitalists who are helping foreign companies, foreign, you know, non-Chinese entrepreneurs to be successful there. And that's where I think we can most, <laughs> that's the lesson I think we need the most out of this. Okay, good question. Other questions? Yeah, um, do you have any thoughts on the challenges in China regarding the migrant uh, workforce dynamics? From uh, country to city? Exactly. So individuals wanting more of a choice in you know, staying with the position, staying with the company, or staying in a province. Well, you see, forced. if China would satisfied with moving from stage one to stage two, this would have been a natural thing. It would have been difficult to manage, but these people would have gotten relatively low-paying factory jobs that would have kept them employed in the cities. As it is, you have such a rapidly changing situation that there's a lot less stability and a lot more possibility for social problems. So it certainly bears watching. Um, I don't have a better crystal ball than that. <laughs> Maybe one more question or comment? We've got some refreshments outside, and I hope that we can stand around and, and get to know each other. Go ahead. Do you think there's a problem also of scale? Of scale? So Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, all have a certain size of the market, of course. Yeah. So the only way for them to, to grow further outside is outside of their country. So that is also a big drawback. Uh, for that company. Yeah, the other thing is... Um, can, I, can I stop you there? Because that's a great point. It's either a disadvantage or it's a very interesting advantage. Think about Silicon Valley. We have a totally uninteresting market size in Silicon Valley. If it weren't for the American market and now for the Pacific Rim market, we wouldn't be able to cre create these world-leading companies. We depend on them gaining their strength from the world market. So I do think that um, it's not automatically a bad thing, okay? Therefore, companies that are successful, let's say in China or in Japan or in different countries, have a very hard time to internationalize and to grow internationally, and that's what is preventing them from going for. Take, for yeah. example, Baidu yeah. tried to go in Japan and in, in Taiwan, but never succeeded. Alibaba did the same. Um, Many of those companies try to grow outside of their home market, yeah. but never successfully. And didn't do too well. Exactly. Uh, it's hard to do global business. And I think that um, what I see that worries me in China is an increasingly domestic focus. I mean, it used to be that the big Chinese companies were really providing product to the EU, US, and Japan they were kind of had intrinsically global business models. As a country becomes more focused in on itself, the danger of losing the benefits for all of us of a global business environment increase. And I think that that's one thing that I see as kind of a cloud on the horizon. And it could also happen in other places. You know, Japan is obsessed with going back to 2% uh, inflation. So Japan is looking at its own fiscal policy and its own, you know, whatever. Um, that may not be the best thing for Japan. I'm, I'm not making any comment about the current government, but just if you, make your, if you look at yourself as an isolated part of the system, um, you make decisions that are different from seeing yourself as part of an integrated whole. And I do think that we've done a great job in Silicon Valley of seeing ourselves as part of an integrated whole. Uh, that's one of the things that the companies here have done well with, even though I know several cases of companies that were too slow to go to overseas markets, or they didn't do it in a good way. Uh, it is harder.
It's a lot harder to do successful business on a world scale. This is another reason I want to do this theme of um, global startups this quarter, is I really think this is an interesting new term that I'm hearing from a lot of people in a lot of different places, and we're in a good position to take advantage of it. Apps these days. Yeah, right. And, and using fact, the app the store. Order. Let's fall in into the day and have some refreshments outside. Thanks, everybody.